Welcome to this second recorded video that goes over the second part of the module six lecture part A, and this is on the Adeline or adaptive linear neuron. And you can click on this link to take you to the wiki article about this particular uh, artificial neuron to read more. The key points about this are that when data are only, are only almost linearly separable, as we saw with the advanced deficiency statistics for teams for NBA that decide that determine whether or not a team maybe is uh, good enough to make the playoffs or not, then instead of instead of absolutely linearly separable as is required for the perceptron, we just have to live with some misclassifications, meaning that predictions given by what we consider the optimal weights and bias terms are not always going to equal the actual cl va classified values of YI for some subset of our data. We're just gonna have to live with that. So what is optimal will in general mean that we minimize the misclassification percent rather than simply make it zero. This idea is explored more in our next neuron model, which is the Adeline, the adaptive linear neuron. So you just have to be patient for now. Now the Adeline is an adaptive, is an alternative neuron model developed a few years after the perceptron was introduced. Unlike the perceptron that learns the weights and bias based on the misclassification error, either being negative two, zero or two, and that was discussed before in terms of whether you wanted to shift the function, the activation function to the left, to the right, or you didn't have to shift it at all because there was no misclassification. What we end up doing is taking the net input function here and the activation function in Adeline is actually considered the identity function, which means we simply use the errors defined by the difference of the value yi and the output of this uh, function, the, this linear combination of the features plus the bias. So in that way, it starts to look a lot more like the uh, regression. And you'll see this below. But once the weights and the bias are learned, we still do need to compute f of w dot x plus b to classify any particular feature vector x. The function f from before is now called a quantizer instead of an activation function. So there's just some linguistic uh, manipulation that's done here and maybe sleight of hand as it might seem. The, it's best summarized in this figure. So here, right, we went over this figure for the perceptron before and we have this activation function. It's now called a quantizer in the Adeline. So this is what maps to negative one or one. The difference is our activation function is an identity like y equals x type of line. And now we compute and optimize at this step. And you could say, well, why isn't that just like regression? Well, the error is determined by the y values being one or negative one minus this line, as opposed to values off of this line minus this. So it still will end up being a sum square error, but it's not the same thing as regression. And you'll have to look at this. So, right, y is just negative ones and ones. It's not actually values off of this line, but the values on the line, and I'm saying line as if it's like, you know, one dimensional feature space but the values of this output are continuous. So even if you just subtract one or uh, negative one or take negative one or one minus this, you are still gonna get continuous error because this value is continuously valued. It's like evaluating the line, even if the output values are based on quantized output values. So this error does not take on discrete values anymore, but it's still not the same type of error that you would compute if you were doing regression, because that would be the idea that the yi values were somehow modeled from this line instead of just being one or negative one like we have here. So it's gonna look very similar, again, to the regression that we saw before, but it's not the same thing because it, we're not assuming these yi values from the data are coming from this line, just that they should have the correct sign, S-I-G-N sign. So we still form a sum square of errors, but you notice unlike um, previous where we talked about the sum square error in the uh, regression, now we're calling J this quadratic function. Um, it's J is a common notation that's used in quadratic optimization and regression. And we have a function of the weights and bias terms. As you shift those, you change the function value. You're taking all these uh, differences between the classified data. These are just ones or negative one values in this continuous data. You square them, add them all up from one to n because you have n of the data. And we multiply by one half here. This has to do with something from calculus uh, where when we differentiate to try to minimize this functional and we take derivatives and look for where derivatives are equal to zero so that we can optimize. This is all hearkening back to that fourth module, right? It, 
laid some important concepts at our feet that we're using here. This two from squaring comes down and cancels with that one half and it makes everything kind of nice. But if you forget all the calculus, or if you don't know calculus, it kind of comes down to this. This quadratic function kind of looks like a big bowl if you were able to visualize the response of j as you vary w and b of this function j of w b and a three as a three-dimensional representation it could kind of look like a quadratic bowl over the the space where you had the weights and the bias term now the bias uh axis has one dimensional and this weight axis you could kind of think is a multi-dimensional axis so this is a real kind of mathematical conceptualization and abstraction of what's going on and it might seem weird but the picture is kind of telling the story the response by design is quadratic. So conceptually, it's very similar to just taking a big bowl, a quadratic bowl, and saying, figure out the W and B values that give me the smallest point, the minimum, the bottom of the bowl. That's what we want. That's the objective. We want to minimize this cost function. This is considered a cost function, uh, J. We just want to minimize it. We want to figure out the W and B values such that when we evaluate J there, we're at the bottom of this bowl. That's the whole game so is there a unique minimum here that is correct right we didn't see unique w's and b's when we were looking at the perceptron if you recall if we changed the learning rate in uh the number uh well the number of epochs didn't really some matter as long as it converged but if you change the learning rate or the initial values of the initial guesses of the weights or bias we could see lots of values that worked but since the cost function here is a quadratic function it does have a unique global minimum even if the data are not linearly separable this is the part where you say woo so this means we can always train an Adeline, at least theoretically. Now, I should say that this is under some additional assumptions I'm not stating. You could make it so that there's maybe not a unique solution to this in some cases, but those are kind of degenerate for our purposes. But in most cases you'd consider with the Adeline, you, can, you should be able to assume that the, there's a unique W and B in most cases you come across in practice. All right. So now what I get into is a calculus thing involving minimizing the gradient. Uh, and there's just this whole discussion here that you can read through about what is gradient descent. There's a link here. I'm describing the idea, but at again, conceptual level, and you should read through all of it. Uh, if you have taken multivariate calculus, it's a good refresher. If you haven't, just look at this picture. What I'm drawing below the bowl, the quadratic bowl, are contour lines of this. The idea of a gradient is it's like a vector of partial derivatives and it points in the direction of steepest ascent, meaning if you move in the direction of that gradient, you are going to move up the bowl. You're going to increase the value. Well, clearly we want to move in the opposite. We want to multiply the gradient by negative one to switch the direction because we want to move towards a minimum. So there's issues with that though because it's like how far should you move in the direction pointed to by the gradient factor? So what I show here in this set of code is just a quadratic function over 1D, and I'm showing an initial guess that's initially uh, here at a value of two. So this is the X old is the where you're kind of initialize things. I put it at two. I have a step size of 0 0.025, and now that's basically the, the derivative of this case is the gradient in 1D, and it's I'm moving in the negative direction I want to move down here and with a step size of 0 0.025, this is the first iteration. Look what happens if the number of iterations becomes two, right? I move closer to the minimum. What happens if I make number of iterations three? Again, closer to zero and four and five and six and seven and eight and nine. And you're pretty much there, right? It's, at, it's, it's converging very well in this case with 0 0.025. But let's reset this to one, right? So there's our first iteration. But what if our learning rate doubled? What if we wanted to make this 0 0.05 instead of 0 0.025? You could say, wow, that looks like it nailed it right away. It went to zero. That looks pretty good. So did that converge if we go two, three, four? Yeah, it did it in one step. That was great. That's usually not gonna happen, but that's at 0 0.05. What if, all right, let's go back to one. I go to 0 0.05, let's just make it a little larger. Point. I don't think I can, if I have that level of, uh, the step size are, are 0 0.01. Maybe I can do that, let's see, 0 0.051. Can I do 0 0.051? I think, yes, I can. I move just to the left. I move just a little past that zero. So what happens if my iterations increase? I go to two, 
that seemed to work. That didn't. That wasn't so bad. It, that converged as well. But I did overshoot the minimum on the initial one. What happens if I go to 0 0.07? Right? I overshot the min, but I came back and it still looks like it's going to converge. Go three, four, five. Yeah, it seems to converge, but it's kind of overshooting it each time and it has to correct. What happens if you go to a learning rate of 0.1? All right. Not only do you overshoot, like it, this is just, it's just going back and forth. There's no convergence towards the mean. This is too large of a learning rate. So I'll just go down to one so you can see that that's one iteration. You see the line, it looks kind of thin if I go to two, and three, and four, and five, and six. It's not doing anything, it's just jumping back and forth. That's why it doesn't look like it's updating. What happens, go to number of iterations, one, go to 0.11 for the learning rate, just a little larger. Now you really overshot the minimum. You you stepped too far in this direction. You stepped so far, you ended up over here. Now if I increase the number of iterations to two, oh my gosh, it overstepped it again. Number of iterations to three. Right, I didn't even plot the curve out that far. It's just going to keep going and going. It's just diverging. So this is again the tricky part of like what's the best learning rate? You have to be careful. Too large of a learning rate, and you know that could have it can be just as problematic or worse as too small of a, a learning rate. So I just want you to play around with that and see that, and then I just show in the end how to take the gradient of the cost function. I just give what it is, and in the end you end up with these updates to the weights in the bias terms. And what happens is you update the weights all at once. You just use all of the data all at once to compute the update to the weight instead of incrementally going through each data, uh, datum and updating the, the weight and bias terms incrementally. You use all of the data all at once. So these details again are spelled out here and you should read through them. Um, there's kind of a change to thinking about what the epochs mean in that case. And then I, again, point out, like, what are the differences between this and the linear function of best fit? Again, it's different. We're, we're not taking y values that are assumed to come from the line. They're just one or negative one as opposed to coming from that line. So that's a little different, but I write out more of this here. And then I just write this quantizer that looks like the same thing as the activation function. I'm just using the language of that line. This is what's going on as I'm looking through the number of epochs, but I use all of the data all at once. And so... Now notice, right, this is my np dot dot xw plus b. That's my linear uh, activation function. It's a different activation function for the adaline. And I subtract y. And notice I'm not doing y. There's none of this because I'm not looping through all the data. I'm using the whole data. So y is like a vector of data, an array of data. x is an array. w is an array of weights for all the features I have. And I'm using all of it. I'm having to take the transpose of the features to make sure this dot product works out right with these errors. And the B, the, the B update is different as well. But that's all spelled out and explained and, and shown in the derivation above. But this is all the code. It's not complicated code. Even though the concepts might seem a little complicated or convoluted, in the end, the amount of code you have to work with and understand is very, very minimal. And so then this follows kind of like what we did above. I'm you know, going to create that 1D training data like I did before. I have this function to visualize um, the, the, data, uh, the updates to the Adeline. And so what this is doing now is showing, right here I have my N, a W and a B. I'm not using like negative five and one or whatever I was doing before for the weights and the bias, but I'm showing the initial classification and the learn classification. And along the way, I'm also showing the net input, that linear activation function, right? What that, that net input looks like across. So I'm just trying to move that line. There you go. And it's just always going to keep updating with more epochs. You're just going to, because of the learning rate, unless it hits the minimum, it's going to be incrementally going towards the optimal weights. But you see like this line, the idea is where it should be crossing zero. Ideally, it should be moving towards something that's kind of in the center of the gap between these two data points. That's what you'd like to see. But that's going to be somewhat dependent on how many data points are here versus how many data points are here. It's just something to play with, get some intuition for it. Um, you can completely remove the gap, set the gap equal to zero now, where the, the perceptron would really struggle or not work with this. The Adeline would be just fine. So notice now, like the data kind of has this instantaneous change, and the perceptron would have really struggled. But if we go out to let's say, you know, 20 epochs here, it's doing pretty good. There's still some misclassification errors, but it's trying to position that net input, that linear, before it goes into the quantizer. 
uh, around where the where it actually has this transition. That's all it's trying to figure out in terms of that, that weight and bias. And you can kind of keep updating and it's like incrementally trying to go there. Maybe if I go to like, you know, 50 epochs, eh, it's not quite there yet. Maybe a hundred. Yeah, it might take a while and maybe you have to adjust the learning rate. Here I set it to be one e to the negative two because that kind of works. If you go one e negative one, right, you get some really bad results because it's too large, like what I was showing above with jumping around. And again, your results may vary because I'm not setting random seeds, which you should, you know, set random seeds for reproducibility. But you can change that R value, um, R, R, one e to negative two, maybe I'll double it, two e negative two point zero two. That also looks like it was too large. I mean, that just seems, yeah, it's jumping around. That's too large, right? That's that's too large. One e to the negative two. You know, maybe I'll go, I'll half it. So five e negative three. So point zero zero five. If I run that, what does that do? So there it seems reasonable. I can just play around something. So at ten, that actually looks pretty good. That looks like it just about nailed it. So maybe that's a really good one to use. Play around with it yourself. And again, it could be dependent on the data set you have, but you could set random seeds to play with it. All I'm asking you to do in this activity for a perceptron with linearly separable data, but no gap. This is linearly separable data in the sense that the, the, the intervals to containing the data don't overlap, but there is no gap. I want you to create a code cell below to try learning the weights for a perceptron when the data are linearly separable, but without a well-defined gap as above. So use like this training data with no gap. And I want you to comment on what you see in a markdown cell. Like, look at how long, look what happens as you try to run it and how many epochs it takes to get anything kind of reasonable or if you even, if it, if, if it works at all. I do some additional visualization of the Adeline with um, the 2D data. So uh, this is just a visualization function, just a lot of plotting types commands. This I'm creating the data. I've moved the boxes around. And so that's all that's going on here. I should really split these cells. So I'll go ahead and do that. Let me split the cell there we go so here's just me creating data and then here's me running the out line right so then this is uh, I think I could have just used the created data from before I don't know that this has any difference from what I was doing other than I, I maybe just rewrote it at a different time but you can just see how this runs like I'll just go to a bunch of uh, epochs there we go now I'm just I'm outputting the cost function right because we're trying to minimize that notice at it's always getting smaller so like at a hundred right this is in scientific notation so it's 19.8 is the value of that minimization function and it hasn't properly classified everything but at 200 epochs the value is 10.7 and it definitely has no misclassification error but if you go to 300 epochs See, it shifted the line a bit. It's trying to learn how to minimize this. So even though it found a separable way and it didn't have any misclassification error, it doesn't mean it can't be made better. Whereas the perceptron would stop updating, this will keep updating until it gets to the minimum. That's 9.57, smaller than 10.7. Go to 500, 9.42, right? So it's, it's still shifting the line around trying to minimize that cost functional. And the great thing is you can also do this on that basketball data. So whereas the perceptron, right, we saw with one iteration, it was just awful. Here, it's like, okay, 3,790 is the current value approximately of the cost functional. You go out to, say, 100 epochs, you got it down to 2,000, right? And that actually looks like a line. That division looks like a pretty reasonable variation, right? Like, it looks better than the one on the left. It looks like it's going to do a better job of classifying what's a playoff team versus a non-playoff team. Just visually, we can see that. And the cost functional also quantifies that reduction in errors. If we go out to, let's say, 500, yeah, we can get it down to about 2,000 from the 3,000 it started, or 3,700, I think it started at. Let me go back to that. Yeah, 3,790. So if you iterate a lot on this, you're able to reduce the um, cost functional by a, you know more than a third of its value. And it does seem to do a very good job of, you know, you're know you gonna have some misclassification, but it seems maybe about as optimal as it could be. And certainly with that set of weights that are learned with this model, if I gave you a, team, a, a hypothetical team and said, if they ran these schemes, they would have this offensive and defensive efficiency and they ended up here, you'd say, you know what? That looks like a playoff team. Or if you looked at the offensive and defensive 
defensive statistics or simulated what it might be based on games and ended up being up here, you go, yeah, I don't think they're going to make the playoffs based on historical data. There's many additional important concepts that I describe here. I also describe how I tried to do some other example and it didn't work out and there were issues with me doing that. It was from based on uh, NFL draft data from 2020 and some lessons that I learned from there. And then just some other questions. I just leave it kind of with some open-ended things that we can't exactly solve at this point with the amount of uh, knowledge we have. And then there's the summary activity. So it's a shorter video. Uh, there's not as much to say with the Adeline because we kind of said a lot with the Perceptron, but I hope you found it useful. And if let me know if you have any questions, post them on Canvas.